May the grace of our transfigured Lord Jesus, the light of the world, shine in your hearts now and always. Amen. Much has happened in the last nine months since Jacob entered into our family. Many changes have happened in his life. Many changes I'm sure that you have observed as you have raised your own children. One change, though, that stands out to me more than any other change is the fact that he has learned the word no. Not that he has learned to speak the word no yet, but he has learned that when we say that word no, he shakes his head and ignores us. And for instance, the other day, and actually several times now recently, we have told him no, the dog food and the dog water is not for him. And we have taken him away from it. We've said no, Jacob. He looks at us and at superhuman speed crawls across the floor and still goes for it anyhow. Also the dishwasher. We have told him, no, you can't climb on the door. He shakes his head, looks up at us, smiles, and tries to go for it anyway. Now, like I said, I don't think that this is probably a surprise for you if you've raised any children or if you've been a child. You know that even though... uh, that even though the children don't exactly know how to say the word, that they already can say no, and they can already shake their head and not listen to you. And it's not just something that happens when a child is six months old, but six years, 16 years, even 60-year-old children will still say no and shake their head. No, it's actually part of, the, part of us, isn't it? They say as, as early as six months old, we already learn to manipulate. We already learn to practice this idea of no and this idea of, of shaking our heads and not listening. And so it should be no surprise to us that we have the disciples in our gospel lesson today with a problem in listening. Isn't that exactly why the Father said, this is my beloved Son, listen to him. Mark chapter 9, verse 7. That's a little bit of amendment from just seven weeks ago at Jesus' baptism, isn't it? Because if you think back to Mark chapter 1, where Jesus was baptized, what did the Father say? This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. He didn't have to append that, listen to him on the end, did he? No, the disciples should have known, right? They should have known exactly who Jesus was. They had witnessed his miracles. They had heard his parables. He had told them who he was, and yet the father still had to say, listen to him. So why is that? Why did the father still have to say, listen to him? Why didn't they get it? What was missing for them? What didn't they quite understand? Well, our text kind of betrays it to us a little bit, doesn't it? Because here we have Peter. Well, he gives pays Christ a great compliment, he still misses the point because he calls him rabbi. Now, rabbi, like I said, is a great compliment. He is saying, you are a teacher. You are an instructor. You are the one we follow. But that's a far stretch from the word Lord, isn't it? And if we fast forward just a little bit in time and we go to the night of the Lord's Supper, we know that only one called Jesus rabbi instead of Lord, and that was Judas. But not only that, but he was still focused on earthly things. He was still missing that the Son of God was standing in his presence. Even though he had the light, the transfigured face of Christ before him, he still was focused on the earth. Let me set up dwelling places. But it wasn't just Peter. James and John had the same problem. Just a little bit later in chapter 9 and following chapters, they asked Jesus, well, who could sit on your left and who can sit on your right? They're still focused on earthly things. They're not ready to listen to God. They're shaking their head, no. And they don't completely understand what Jesus' mission is to the earth. And so here we have Jesus trying to instruct the disciples, trying to show them his way. But they don't seem to get it. Not even when he goes to the cross. Not even when he dies. Even when he rises again. The disciples still ask that question. Well, Jesus... Are you now going to reestablish your kingdom? They almost kind of got it at the ascension, right? But when we look at them, it seems like it just, it'd be easy to say, why don't they get it? They were right there with Jesus the whole time. They heard him speak. They saw his face transfigured. They had a sneak peek of Christ as we will one day see him on the last day. 
they still didn't understand. We might be ready to make excuses for them, saying, well, we have the advantage of, of hindsight. Hindsight is twenty twenty, right? We can see exactly. Or they weren't theologians. They were just men, fishermen, common bankers. They didn't know exactly what was going on. But these excuses, I think they come awful quickly for us because we'd like to make an excuse for them because it's so easy then to make excuses for ourselves. Here we have the opportunity to look back, to see exactly who Jesus is, to see exactly what he did. We have the opportunity to see that the end of the story came, that Jesus did rise again just as he promised. With the disciples, we can make the excuse for them, but what about ourselves? What about ourselves who have seen, who have witnessed the glory and power of our Lord? We might make the excuse, well, they were in his presence. But doesn't God himself promise to be present with us, to give us a sneak peek of that banquet feast every week in the Lord's Supper? To be present in his very body and blood. So, why don't we get it? Why do we struggle so much to listen, to hear exactly what God is saying? Why do we struggle and say, no, 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 shaking our heads? Sometimes I think it's because we're a little scared. Because when we listen to God, it means we do things that are a little different than the world. It means that we might have to offend a friend or a neighbor because we tell them that the way they're living is not the way that God has called them to live. It means that we do set an example by our own lives. When we listen to God, when we read His Word in Scripture, we do seek to reflect His glory, that which He showed to us in His Scripture, by living a life that is not like the rest of the world. By listening to Him, we also know that there is command to us to share that which we have been shown, to share that promise which we have been given. And so we have that added burden of sharing the gospel. And I don't actually believe it's a burden, but sometimes I think that's the way we treat it. That we look at it and we say, well, this is an additional burden to my life. That following your law, Lord, is a burden. That calling someone on their sin is a burden. And so we shake our heads no. And we walk around as though we know better, or hopefully none of you are still crawling around as you, though you know better. And we say, Lord, no, you listen. I know exactly the way life should go. In fact, we would like to take it a step further, not just our personal lives, but we go a step further and we say, Lord, I know how this country should be run. I know that peace should be upon this earth. And we say, Lord, I know that my plan is better than your plan. Now I admit, I don't think any of you actually say this out loud. But isn't that the question we ask? Isn't that the challenge we make to our God? When we do, say to Him, Why, Lord? Why is Your plan different than my own? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Because it's easy when we look at the disciples to make those excuses, to, to take it off of ourselves. But when we are faced with that question ourselves, we're forced to realize that we have the same listening problem. The same problem of not getting it. And so our God says to us, listen up. Listen up, you people. But not like that, does he? Our God doesn't call us like a drill sergeant and call us to orders. He doesn't shout at us and scream at us. But he says, listen up. You don't get it. You don't understand Listen up. Well, I have a plan. A plan that is better than your plan. Listen up. I know what is to come. I know what has happened. And I know whatever will be. Listen up. Because I know that you are people who are sinful. You are people who have failed to keep my commands. You are people who have turned your back on me. But listen up. I have a plan. I have a plan to take your place. Listen up. I'm going to sacrifice my own son for you. Listen close. Because it is for you. Listen close because, that, because I will continue to pay for your sins each and every day. 
Listen up, you people. I love you so much that I am not willing to take a chance, but I'm going to come myself in the form of a man, take on human flesh, and die for each one of your sins. Listen to us, because this is how much I love you. This is how much I care about you. And this is how much I want you to know. How much I want you to know that you are valuable to me. That is exactly what our God said when He sent Christ Jesus into the world. That is exactly what He said when He showed us that Jesus was the fulfillment of all prophecies that came before. That Jesus was the one who could take our places because even when He was called to die on the cross so, and brutally suffer, He still listened to the, the commands the, of the Father. And He bore the cross. He hung on the cross. But He rose. He did not die there and stay in the tomb. But He said, listen up, I have risen from the dead. I have defeated death that it may no longer control you. I have overcome sin that it may no longer ruin you. And I have taken your place that you can always be in my place in, the heaven, in heaven with, my, with, our, with the Father. That is what our Lord said when He called us to listen up. To listen to Him. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. As He climbed that mount of transfiguration, He knew the glory to come. He knew the beauty of this day. And He knew also the pain that was to follow. Because see, right here in Mark's Gospel, all of a sudden we take a, we start to go, well, we won't say downhill, but down the mountain into the season of Lent. Right here in Mark's Gospel, we make a turn from seeing the miracles of Jesus to seeing His teaching in the last days. And right here, we prepare our hearts for Lent, for the teaching of Jesus. But we don't do so as the disciples did. Because when the, when the crucifixion happened, they were hopeless, weren't they? Peter denied Him. Judas hung himself. The rest of the disciples abandoned Him. But no, we enter this Lenten season knowing that we have a hope that is yet to come. Knowing that just as Christ promised, He did rise again. And that just as He promised, He will come again. But not just with a sneak peek of His glory. Not just in a small way. But in a way that oh, the whole world will know. Will shake with His presence. Will, come, will bow at His name. And we will know. We will know that we are those who have inherited His kingdom. The psalmist writes in Psalm 103, and of that reassuring promise even before Christ came, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His love for those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far He has removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. Our Lord in His compassion and His great love has made us His own, has claimed us as His, and will continue each and every day to look after us. will continue each and every day, even when our ears appear plugged up, He will still keep calling to us. And when we don't hear, He will step in and bring us to Him. And we know how important that is. Because how, how many times do we hear and not come? And so He reaches out to us in His compassion time and again and calls us to Him. And we see this not only in our lives as Christian people, but how often does He continue to call the people of our world, the people of our country, the people of the Imperial County to Him? How often does He reach out His hand to them and call, him ba call them back and say, listen up. Listen up. I have what is better. I have a hope that cannot be broken by this world, that cannot be destroyed. Listen up and listen close, because I love you. And I want you to know my salvation. And He calls. And he calls to us. He calls to them. He calls to His people, because He wants all people to know the promise of His truth. Is that not why He originally sent His Son? 
even though the disciples didn't get, seem to get it until the ascension. We do, don't we? We know that we have a Savior who is not of this world, who is not bound by the weaknesses of this world, but is greater, who has the power to create this world and the power to save this world, the power to redeem us as poor sinners, and the power to redeem all people. And so as we enter to this Lenten season, we know, we know the greatest hope of all. We are not a people who are hopeless, but we are a people who are looking forward. And while we have penitential hearts, hearts of sadness, we know that that sadness is only short-lived because it is coming to an end as well. It is coming to an end when Christ comes and He says, listen up, it's time to come home. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we pray that You would forgive us when we do not listen. When we choose our own paths instead of Yours. When we say no, no, no. And we thank You that You continue to say yes. Say yes to us as Your children and, cho- and continue to call us to You. We thank You, O Lord, that You have been the light who has come into this world and that each and every day You continue to shine into our hearts and into our lives. We pray, Lord, that we would be Your children sharing that light and helping others to know the truth that we, that we know in You, the hope that we have. We pray, Lord, that Your peace may be with us, Your peace which has no end. And this we pray through Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.